It was, you'd have to admit, a pretty extraordinary sequence of events. A lone gunman murders the president of the United States, and then, less than 48 hours later, that lone gunman is himself murdered by another lone gunman. What are the odds of that? Congress found that, yeah, it was a plot. It was a conspiracy. There were multiple people involved. And brought home the first phone call that my father made after J. Edgar Hoover told him that his brother had been shot was to the CIA desk officer in Langley, who was only a mile from our house. And my father said to him, did your people do this? My father was posing the same question to him. Was it our people oh. who did this to my brother? So it was my father's first instinct that the oh. agency had killed his brother. Well, today we decided to find out. We spoke to someone who had access to these still hidden CIA documents. The person was deeply familiar with what they contain. We asked this person directly, did the CIA have a hand in the murder of John F. Kennedy, an American president? And here's the reply we received verbatim. Quote, the answer is yes. I believe they were involved. It's a whole different country from what we thought it was. It's all fake. It's hard to imagine a more jarring response than that. Again, this is not a quote, conspiracy theorist that we spoke to, not even close. This is someone with direct knowledge of the information that once again is being withheld from the American public. And the answer we received was unequivocal. Yes, the CIA was involved in the assassination of the president. Now, some people will not be surprised to hear that. They suspected it all along. But no matter how you feel about or what you thought about the Kennedy assassination, pause to consider what this means. It means that within the US government, there are forces wholly beyond democratic control. These forces are more powerful than the elected officials that supposedly oversee them. These forces can affect election outcomes. They can even hide their complicity in the murder of an American president. In other words, they can do pretty much anything they want. They constitute a government within a government, mocking by their very existence the idea of democracy. By now, most people believe that the CIA probably has something to do with the assassination of JFK. In fact, if the CIA came out today and just admitted it, none of us would be surprised. But throughout all of this, no one has ever been able to answer the simple question. Why? What did JFK do that was so terrible, so threatening to the powers that be, that it would push the CIA to assassinate its own presidents? Well, as it turns out, there were many, many things that JFK did that went completely and utterly against the military-industrial complex. And in this three-part series, we're going to expose the three pivotal moments in JFK's presidency that sealed his fate, so that by the end, you're going to know exactly what it takes to kill a president. This series is based on the incredible book JFK and the Unspeakable by James W. Douglas, a book that every American needs to read and we'll link it below. And our story starts with Eisenhower, when he gave this infamous speech at his farewell address right before a young starry-eyed John F. Kennedy takes office. In the councils of government, we must gar guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. But since Eisenhower was the old president leaving office and there was this new exciting president coming in, no one paid attention to Eisenhower's prophetic speech. But for John F. Kennedy, he would soon realize exactly what Eisenhower meant. Stay dangerous and let's get into it. Wealthy families like the Kennedy family always have financial advisors that help them manage their money. But why? If they're so smart and rich, why wouldn't they just manage their money themselves? It's because rich people are humble enough to know that when it comes to investing, it's really easy to get emotional with your money and it's really easy to do things wrong. So that's why they'll gladly pay top dollar for the best advisors. So if rich people are humble enough to accept that they need advisors, you probably do too if you want to grow or preserve your wealth. The problem is finding an advisor is tricky. A lot of them act like they have your best interests at heart when in reality they don't. But luckily that is where Money Pickle comes in. With Money Pickle, all you gotta do is explain your situation to them in a few words, then you pick a time that works for you and then boom, they'll match you with one of their certified financial planners or fiduciaries for a free video call on Zoom. On your video call, they'll be able to really understand your situation and give you tailor-made advice specific to you and only you. I love Money Pickle because instead of spending hours googling an investing or tax planning question and hoping that what I find is right, I can just ask an expert on demand and they'll tell me. 
There are a ton of times to choose from, so you're not going to have trouble finding a time that works, no matter what time zone you're in. So click the link below and schedule your free video call now. Thanks to Money Pickle for being the paid sponsor of this video. Today, JFK is perhaps best known as a young, reckless playboy. He grew up in a rich family, he had affairs in the White House, so what on earth could have been so threatening about this playboy kid that would have justified assassinating him? Well, as it turns out, this is only half of the story. See, beneath this playboy facade, JFK was the exact type of person the powers that be feared the most. JFK had a very difficult childhood. Quote, he saw death approach repeatedly, from scarlet fever when he was 2 and 3 years old, from a succession of childhood and teen illnesses, from a chronic blood condition in boarding school, from osteoporosis and crippling back problems, intensified by war injuries that plagued him the rest of his life, from the adrenal insufficiency of Addison's disease. To family and friends, Jack Kennedy always seemed to be sick and dying, end quote. But that's not all. Most people also forget that JFK was a World War II veteran. And he didn't just work some easy job like a cook or mechanic, by the way. He was a full-blown war hero. He was a boat commander in the South Pacific, and one night, a Japanese destroyer rammed into their small boat destroying it, leaving JFK and his crew stranded in the water. Over the next few days, JFK would repeatedly put his own life at risk to save his teammates. He swam to a nearby island while pulling along one of his injured teammates, using his literal bare teeth, and then he swam back out to sea to try to signal to friendly boats, where he ended up drifting aimlessly for hours teetering on the verge of death, until they were eventually saved. That was the reality of JFK's life. As his brother Robert Kennedy put it, At least one half of the days that he spent on this earth were days of intense physical pain. And it was because of all of this intense physical pain, it was because he had seen firsthand the horrors of war that JFK was not afraid of death anymore. He was prepared to do everything in his power to fight for peace, even if it meant sacrificing his life. Quote, by smiling at his own death, he was free to resist others' deaths. And so, fast forward to January 20th, 1961, and JFK was inaugurated as the president of the US. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning, signifying renewal as well as change. And in the eyes of the most powerful military economic coalition in history, this young, ambitious new president that wasn't afraid of death posed a threat. Because there's nothing more threatening to systematic evil than someone willing to fight against it regardless of the consequences. And here for the first time was a president who couldn't be manipulated by threats or intimidation. He couldn't be backed into a corner by his own generals and advisors. And soon the powers that be would realize just that. To win the presidency, JFK actually campaigned on military expansion. As a World War II veteran, he bought into the military-industrial narrative that America needed to build up as much arms as possible so it could deter the Soviet Union. But once he stepped into the Oval Office, he realized something terrifying. While the US government made it seem like nuclear war was the last thing anyone wanted, JFK quickly discovered that behind closed doors, the guys in charge were a lot more trigger-happy. Remember, this was a time when most people viewed the Soviets as satanic devils that needed to be stopped at all costs. And in the eyes of the powers that be at the time, anything short of absolute aggression towards the Soviets was thought of as treasonous. And shockingly, JFK's top military generals actually believed that America could win an all-out nuclear war. And they didn't just believe that America could win, they actively wanted to go to war with the Soviet Union just so they could win and prove it. And they didn't care how many people had to die in the process. In one general's own words, quote, at the end of the war, if there are two Americans and one Russian left standing, we win, end quote. While another general said that he wanted to publicly attack the Soviet Union from, quote, hell to breakfast, end quote. JFK was horrified by this realization. He thought his number one job as president would be to ensure that a nuclear war never happened. And yet everyone around him was vying for war. Just 10 days into his presidency, JFK found out that almost any military commander could start a nuclear war on their own initiative. They didn't need to get the president's approval, they didn't even need to run it up the chain of command. If they believed that there was enough Soviet military action, like an attack or even just possible reports of an attack, they could trigger nuclear Armageddon in the blink of an eye. It was madness, and it only got worse when JFK was briefed on their game plan for if nuclear war did break out. In the military's plan, 170 atomic and hydrogen bombs would be dropped on the city of Moscow alone. 
Every major Soviet, Chinese, or Eastern European city would get nuked, causing hundreds of millions of deaths. To a president who wanted peace more than anything else, this was unacceptable. Never had he imagined the US military would be so willing to allow the murder of hundreds of millions of people, including Americans, just to win a war. After he was briefed on this war plan, he famously turned to one of his officials and asked, And we call ourselves the human race? JFK started to see just how little power the president actually had. After billions of dollars in funding and years of handing over executive power to American generals, the military had just become too strong and influential. So strong that by the time JFK stepped into office, the military industrial complex already had big plans for him. In 1959, Fidel Castro had become the president of Cuba, which meant that Cuba had just fallen under communism. Sitting just 90 miles off the coast of Florida, Cuba was now the perfect base for the Soviet Union to launch a surprise attack from. So by the time JFK became president just two years later, the CIA was neck deep trying to get rid of Castro, and nothing was off the table. The CIA had tried to assassinate Castro hundreds of times. They put poison in his cigars, paid Cuban gangsters to try to kill him, and even tried to hide explosives in a seashell in an area where he liked to dive. And with every failed attempt, the CIA just got more and more desperate. And that's where JFK came in. The CIA needed to convince the new president to authorize military action against Cuba. Because in their eyes, every day that passes where they don't strike first is another day that America could get annihilated from Cuba. But that was easier said than done. You see, the CIA knew that the president would never authorize anything as drastic as an invasion or an open attack by the US military. It went directly against his plans for peace and de-escalation. But that didn't mean the CIA couldn't force his hand. If they could launch a US-based attack on Cuba, even if it didn't involve Americans directly, JFK would have no choice but to support it and send in reinforcements. Lest the attack failed. Yes, if the CIA could get JFK to agree to an attack led by Cubans but backed by America, and that attack went horribly wrong, he would be forced to send in US troops. As one of the youngest presidents in history, there was no way he was going to risk such a public failure like that just a few months into his presidency. Just imagine the news. Cowardly, inexperienced Kennedy drops the ball against Soviets. It would never happen. JFK would be forced to play along. And so the CIA put their plan into motion. Before JFK was inaugurated, he had been briefed on a plan by the CIA to train Cuban exiles to invade Cuba, to take back their homeland. And right from the start, JFK made it clear that the Cuban exiles would have zero US military support during their invasion. They would be doing it all on their own. Little did he know that the CIA knew this invasion would fail, and that the CIA was betting on him to send in troops anyways once the invasion did fail to save face. And so on April 17, 1961, less than three months into JFK's presidency, 1,400 Cuban exiles touched down on the beaches of Cuba with the intention of taking back Cuba from Castro. And as expected, over the next 24 hours, they proceeded to get decimated by the Cuban military. They were being attacked from all sides and desperately needed air support. And that's where JFK came in. With more than a thousand Cubans at risk of being killed, and America on the verge of a major strategic failure, the CIA called on the president to ask for help. Mr. President, if you don't authorize military support, thousands of people will die, and America would look like a fool. We'd be the laughingstock of the world. Too scared and cowardly to defend ourselves on an island less than 100 miles away? Is that the kind of picture of America you want to paint for our enemies? JFK was backed into a corner, but the CIA had underestimated him because JFK did not budge a single inch. When he said he didn't want any Americans getting involved, he meant it. And so with no US military support, within two days, more than 1,100 exiles had been killed or captured. It was a complete and utter failure. Only after the invasion failed did JFK realize that he had been drawn into a CIA trap. The CIA and US military quote, couldn't believe that a new president like me wouldn't panic and try to save his own face. JFK told one of his aides, well, they had me figured all wrong. It was in that moment that JFK fully realized just what kind of a beast he was up against. Quote, in effect, President Kennedy was a target of a CIA covert operation that collapsed when the invasion collapsed, end quote. And that JFK, quote, bitterly disappointed the CIA and the military by his decision to accept defeat at the Bay of Pigs rather than escalate the battle, end quote. The military industrial complex was pissed, but so was JFK.
When the CIA first came to JFK with the idea of the Bay of Pigs invasion, it was obvious he was hesitant. He had only been president for a few months, and he inherited the plan from Eisenhower. It felt too soon, too rushed, too drastic. Eventually, JFK went ahead with it under the strict conditions that no Americans be involved. But as it turns out, even if JFK had said no to the whole Bay of Pigs operation right then and there, the CIA already had plans to bypass his decision and do it anyways. Take a listen. Quote, when the four anti-Castro brigade leaders told their story to writer Haynes Johnson, they reviewed how the agency was prepared to circumvent a presidential veto. The Cubans' chief CIA military advisor whom they only knew as Frank told them what to do if he secretly informed them that the entire project had been blocked by the administration. Quote, if this happens, you come here and make some kind of show, as if you were putting us the advisors in prison, and you go ahead with the program as we have talked about it, and we will give you the whole plan even if we are your prisoners, end quote. So basically, the head CIA guy in charge of the Cuban exiles told the exiles that if JFK said no to this operation, that they were to stage a revolt, pretend to put the CIA guys in prison, and then go on with the invasion of Cuba as planned. When Robert Kennedy, JFK's brother, heard about this plan, he called it, quote, virtually treason, virtually treason, virtually treason, virtually treason, virtually treason. When all the dust settled, it marked a turning point for JFK's time as president. JFK realized that he could never negotiate, reason, or even trust the CIA. Not when they were willing to lie, trap, or even bypass him without a second thoughts. Quote, the Bay of Pigs awakened President Kennedy to internal forces he feared he might never control, end quote. JFK realized that if he wanted a chance at peace, he would have to wage a different kind of war against the very people in his own government. As the dust settled, JFK turned to one of his highest officials in his administration and said that he wanted to splinter the CIA in a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. And he meant it. While the Bay of Pigs was still going on, JFK told his presidential advisor, Mr. Arthur Schlesinger Jr., that quote, It's a hell of a way to learn things, but I have learned one thing from this business. That is, that we will have to deal with CIA. No one has dealt with CIA. And so from that point on, JFK started splintering the CIA. And he first started by going after the mastermind behind the whole Bay of Pigs fiasco, the infamous CIA director, Mr. Alan Dulles. JFK started splintering the CIA by asking the masterminds behind the Bay of Pigs invasion to resign, which just so happened to be the three highest ranking officers in the CIA, Director Alan Dulles, Deputy Director Richard Bissell Jr., and Deputy Director General Charles Cavill. After firing the three most powerful men in the CIA, JFK then started cutting the CIA's budget, hoping to reach a 20% reduction by 1966. And from then on, instead of relying on the CIA for advice on foreign policy, he made the military Joint Chiefs of Staff his main advisors, because he foolishly believed that the military would be easier to control than the CIA. The CIA has spent the last few decades operating with impunity, and now this young, naive president thought that he was going to ring them in? Nonsense. No one was more salty about this than the CIA director that he fired, Mr. Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles was the most notorious CIA director in history. He was the guy that brought down Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran. He brought down Salvatore Allende in Chile, and he ran the insane MK Ultra mind control project that illegally experimented on thousands of Americans in the 50s. You can watch our private documentary on that by clicking the card on the top right corner. All these accolades that Mr. Dulles had built up was all being stripped away from him by little John F. Kennedy. So if it wasn't clear then, it was clear as day now. The CIA's number one enemy was no longer some foreign communist, it was no longer some foreign terrorist. No, the CIA's number one enemy was now the Commander-in-Chief, President John F. Kennedy. After Kennedy's assassination, Alan Dulles would ironically be appointed to the Warren Commission, the commission that was in charge of investigating JFK's death. So in effect, Alan Dulles was helping lead an investigation into himself. And guess what conclusion he came to in that investigation? Years later, when Alan Dulles was old and retired, he had a ghostwriter come over to his mansion to collaborate on a piece defending the CIA's role in the Bay of Pigs invasion. Quote, in one discussion they had about President Kennedy, Dulles stunned the ghostwriter with an abrupt comment. That little Kennedy, Dulles said, he thought he was a god. He thought he was a god. He thought he was a god. Even though JFK managed to cut down some of the CIA's power, he quickly realized that the CIA wasn't the only problem. 
Even though the CIA had been the one to plan the Bay of Pigs invasion, it was the US military chiefs who signed off on it, and it was them who pushed JFK to let the US military intervene. So if it was both the CIA and the military that were at odds with them, JFK had a much bigger problem on his hands than he expected. It was the summer of 1962, a year after the Bay of Pigs invasion ended in disaster. One of JFK's friends asked him what he thought of a best-selling novel at the time about a fictional military takeover in the United States. JFK read the entire book that night. The very next day, he discussed the possibility of such a military coup in America to his friends. It's possible, he said. It could happen in this country, but the conditions would have to be just right. If, for example, the country had a young president and he had a bay of pigs, there would be a certain uneasiness. Maybe the military would do a little criticizing behind his back, but this would be written off as the usual military dissatisfaction with civilian control. Then if there were another Bay of Pigs, the reaction of the country would be, is he too young and inexperienced? The military would almost feel that it was their patriotic obligation to stand ready to preserve the integrity of the nation, and only God knows just what segment of democracy they would be defending if they overthrew the elected establishment. Pausing for a moment, he went on. Then if there were a third Bay of Pigs, it could happen, but it won't happen on my watch. JFK had just had his first Bay of Pigs, but little did he know that his second one was just around the corner. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. All this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days. But let us begin. 